Okay, I'm going to make a start because we don't have a lot of time. I'm just waiting for these lights to be turned out um, because then you'll be able to see the slides more clearly, I hope. Um, and we'll not worry that it's going... Sorry? That's absolutely fine. I prefer the dark. Um, thank you very much, Lisa. Um, those of you who were party to the workshop, um, you'll bear with me because I may repeat some of the things that I said to you in the course of this short presentation. I'm calling this Queer Tango and Performance, Realising Gender Through Dancing. Now, my narrow interest is in Queer Tango, but um, in, in approaching it, I'm, I am interested in the manner in which gender is realised. Each of you has an ordinary life where your gender uh, is a function of it, I imagine, and each of you also performs and upon occasion may be required to represent a gender. We're going to unpack some of those things to try and understand a little better how those things work. And we're going to do it a little bit through queer tank. So we're going to be thinking about tango. We're going to be thinking about queer tango. We're going to be thinking about queer, just a little bit. And we're going to be thinking about performance. And we're going to be thinking about gender, so all those things are in there. These are the questions that I'm going to ask in the next few minutes. How is gender realized in life? Every one of us has a body of evidence about how that happens. You might want to think about how people respond to you, react to you and the things that you might either do or are that enable a gender reading of you to occur. How is gender realized in tango dance performance and also how is gender realized in queer tango dance performance? And how can gender in life inform gender in performance? So the first thing we have to ask ourselves is what is gender? Um, this is a, an interesting thinker about this. That this one is called Judith Butler. Uh, you won't have to read her. You can if you're interested in gender. But I've uh, sort of invited her to share her ideas with us. Now. It's one thing to say that gender is performed. And that's a little different from saying gender is performative. When we say gender is performed, we usually mean that we've taken on a role, we're acting in some way, um, and that our acting or our role playing is crucial to the gender that we are and the gender that we present to the world. To say that gender is performative is a little different because for something to be performative means that it produces a series of effects. We act and walk and speak and talk in ways that consolidate an impression of being a man or being a woman. Actually, it's a phenomenon that's being produced all the time and reproduced all the time. So to say gender is performative is to say that nobody really is a gender from the start. I know it's controversial, but that's my claim. And indeed that is her claim, and she's famous for it. I invite you to have a think about it. I'm not saying it's true, or indeed I'm not saying whether I agree with it or but it's one of the ideas that's out there. Did you notice that she was drawing a distinction between gender as performance, and you're all performers, and gender as being performative? The point that she's making there is that she's arguing our genders are realized through constant, the constant doing of them. That's performative. Rather than taking a deliberate decision, I am now going to act a man, or act a woman, perform a man, Former woman. It's a distinction that may be useful. So, queer tango. Queer. Queer is a term, it's difficult. Um, because the word is used in a number of different circumstances, it can just mean, it can be like a new word for LGBT. Sometimes people use it in that sense. It also has a formal theoretical meaning, and I'm very briefly going to acquaint you with that. Generally speaking, if we were asked to identify ourselves, we might think about this opposite of man and woman, and we might locate ourselves absolutely at one end or the other, 
or we might indicate that we are somewhere in the bit in between. It's a possibility. But conceptually, that's how we think of ourselves. We might think of ourselves in terms of sexual orientation. I've spent most of my adult life thinking of myself as a gay man. That's, that's how I self-identify, if you like. So there's LGBT and straight, potentially there. So we could locate ourselves somewhere on that flat surface there. If we add in another one, and on that LGBT line, maybe had lesbian at one end and gay man at the other, bisexual, transgender, and you name the other ones, somewhere perhaps there. So this is starting to get to be quite a complex, um, and, and possibly even, if we're sort of thinking in terms of a diagram, um, it's sort of making a space where we could locate ourselves if we chose. One of the things that queer theory does is says, actually, when you use that terminology, so if I say that I'm a gay man, then that sort of sets a load of expectations about what people think that I am, what I might do, how I might relate to other people, and potentially those things could be oppressive. So queer theory says, um, actually, this whole system has turned into something of a cage, and the thing to do with it <laughs> is to get rid of it. And so queer gets rid of the normative binaries and argues that the lived life, the way in which people actually live, is a lot more complicated than any of that stuff, and that that stuff doesn't allow that to be the case. <clears throat> what it means is that some of this baggage is there in queer tango, and we may come back to it, but I thought you all to know about that. Let's go to tango for a moment. So, yeah, there it is, there it is. Look, if you put the word tango into Google image search, there they are, and substantially, what it consists of is a lot of dark men with a lot of red women who are bent double. It's sort of um, amazing, the uniformity of this stuff. You just see example after example, um, and uh, after all, this is basically the format that almost everybody is familiar with. So let's start with where most people are with regard to... Don't get it. Come on, play the game, it's just loading. This is the bit where you just wish the technology would be a little more cooperative. Okay, it's not going to do it. I'm just coming out of there. of tango is, oh, it's that really sexy dance, you do lots of flippy things. And of course it helps if you've got cameramen wheeling around you to give the illusion that you're doing a hell of a lot more than actually you are. But we'll not go there, it's popular entertainment and that's absolutely fine. 
So, I suppose the question that I'm asking now is, how did we get to this? And in order to understand how we got here, we need to just do a bit of history. I'm calling it a history. Um, this is a very loose history. So, once upon a time, the tango emerged in Argentina and Uruguay around the turn of the last century. So we're talking 80, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, there's the River Plate, uh, Argentina to the north, Montevideo and Uruguay to the south. And uh, this is where the people who are in the workshop will see this as familiar. Um, we're looking at a country, if we're thinking about Argentina particularly, where there is mass immigration. A bit like there was in North America, but here it's happening in, in South America. So lots of people coming from Europe. And what happens is, um, Argentina has this incredibly um, fertile landscape. And once you've murdered all the people who lived there, that was very necessary, called the Wars of, I can't remember the exact name, but they essentially did murder the people who were there, and then put fences around it and uh, got cattle in, and started making masses and masses and masses of money. Argentina became a bit like the Klondike in California. It was somewhere that you could go and you could make money. This is Buenos Aires in 1865. And not surprisingly, it looks like the Wild West, because it is, sort of, just that it's in South America. And there's not that much there. And within the space of about 30 years, an entire European-style city is brought out of the ground. Buenos Aires means good air. It's like an estate agent had given it the name, because actually it's built on marshland. But it is built to look like this, and indeed it still looks a bit like that. And all the way through, all the way through, the model for this stylish, elegant city was Paris. The Argentinians wanted to build a modern, European-style state. And initially they thought the way to do this was to get lots of Europeans in, and the state would almost build itself. Certainly in terms of the population of Buenos Aires, 1869, 180,000 to 1.4 million in 1940. That is a phenomenal rate of growth. A rate of growth, but there's not much infrastructure. You've got mass immigration. You've got a lot of very, very poor people. This is called a conventijo. It is a courtyard, um, a conventional Buenos Aires way of living. Very dense, possibly hot bedding. Um, some of these things don't change. It still happens when you get a lot of poor immigrants in the UK at the moment. Um, some people got rich. These people got rich. You had, a, you had this layer of fantastically wealthy people. Um, I visited a house in Buenos Aires that had been inhabited by wealthy people. They wanted a new fireplace. So they thought, right, new fireplace. Who should we ask to design it? Rodin. That's who. The most famous sculptor of the late 19th, early 20th century, they commissioned Rodin to design their fireplace. And they offered him so much money that he agreed to do it. It didn't get built because the First World War happened. But that's how wealthy they were. There was an expression then, as wealthy as an Argentinian. So you can see this is a, a great pull to these people coming in. Just take a very close look at this photograph for a moment of immigrants. Um, People who are in the class don't answer. What do you notice about this group of immigrants? Hmm? They're, all white. They're all white. This is true. Anything else? They're all, men. They're all men. They are all men. There is in there it's one woman, and there she is. And she's been put at the center because she is a rarity. At the time of Tango's genesis, there were roughly seven men to every woman. That is a very odd kind of society, a very strange mix. Um, the government took it very seriously that this, this, there was this sort of uh, asymmetric distribution, and they opened government-sanctioned brothels in order to try and stabilize this curious society. So, if you discount that of those women, some of those women were professional women working in the sex industry. 
that makes the ratio of man to eligible to marry woman um, even more extreme. And competition for women was fierce. What do they do? One way of meeting a woman, this by the way is a myth that I'm telling you. This is a story that is based on some truths. It is not a complete set of truths. Um, because the competition for women was so strong, if you were to meet a woman who you might want to have as a wife, you might meet her at a milonga, at a tango dance. And if you dance with a woman, think about it now, all of the women in this room, think about it from the perspective of the women then. If you were living in Europe, probably you would get your status from your father, and then eventually you'd get your status from your husband, and that's how you'd be safe and secure. In Europe, you'd probably have to marry the first man who asked you. Read Jane Austen. It's full of arrangements for marriages which are based on property and security. <coughs> in Argentina, you don't have to do that because there is a queue of men. And what it means is that if the man is going to dance with the woman, the man has to make the woman feel fantastic. The reason that this myth is worth knowing about is that it is argued that it continues to inform how the social dance is danced to this day. In order to get good at dancing so that when they dance with somebody, they'd be accomplished, they wouldn't make the woman look a fool, they practiced with one another. I've just given a paper where I've found four other reasons why they might have danced with one another. But this is the story that the men later on get comfortable with. When tango becomes respectable, we'll get there in a moment. When tango becomes respectable, this is how you explain these pictures. There's lots of pictures like this, of men apparently dancing with one another. They were only practicing. Oh, that's all right then. So none of them were gay. Oh, well, maybe just a few. So they didn't do it for other reasons. Oh, well, maybe they wanted somebody to hold them. Who knows? Who knows? But this is the story everybody was comfortable with. They were just practicing. So, there we are. Um, this is for another day. That one you'll see constantly reproduced. They were only practicing. Yeah, it could take three years to learn to dance. And you'd start doing the woman's role. So you'd start learning what it was like to be comfortably and properly led before you even attempt to do the thing yourself. It's a big bit of history, but we've not yet the historical reasons we're going to zip on because... And we do it from there. Okay. Right, so tango goes from being the property of the marginalized people in Argentinian society, the very poor, um, criminals, pimps, prostitutes, Basically, people who have no status to lose. There is historical evidence that lesbians dance with each other and that gay men dance with each other, sometimes at um, places that we would now think of as gay venues, and they did it in order to entertain one another. This bit of the history, like the history connected with Africa, gets written out of the books when something happens. The very, very rich men go to the brothels, and they learn tango, and then they get sent to Europe and they go to Paris, which is the place they're all obsessed with, and they dance tango with French women, and they do it sufficiently well for them to think, wow, this is interesting, this is really interesting. And you get this phenomenon called tango mania, which takes over and peaks in 1913. Initially, um, the Argentinians are horrified, horrified. Here they are trying to build this modern European state, and this coarse, vulgar dance, the Trump of dances, if you like, <laughs> is taking over. And the Argentinian ambassador said, Tango in Buenos Aires is only danced in houses of ill repute, brothels, uh, uh, and bars of very low esteem. Tango is never danced in civilized salons or by civilized people. Tango music evokes very unpleasant associations to Argentine. So this is the ambassador saying, don't pay any attention to them. Don't, don't. It's not even Argentine, you know, it's not thoroughly Argentinian. But what happens is 
it becomes immensely fashionable in Paris, and suddenly the elite want it. They want it, but they tame it. They bring it into the salon. Oh, we won't go there. Okay, they bring it into the salon, and essentially it becomes this, this slightly less rough dance, and its history gets rewritten. Or rather, bits of it get obliterated and forgotten, because now they need a tidy evolutionary story. If this is going to be the symbol of the nation, then it has to be in some way pure and uh, very much of the character that they want Argentina to be seen as exhibiting. Performance. Okay, we're going to look at the most famous tango performance ever, and we're going to look at it because almost every tango performance that happens after it owes it some kind of debt as we will see. This is Rudolf Valentino, that is Beatrice Dominguez, and the film is The Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. I watched it all the way through the other day, it's a silent film, it's really good. But we're going to look at a bit of it, and because we're looking at how gender is realised in performance, I want you to look at it and to arrive at your own decisions about how you think gender is being expressed through this. But it's worth watching in its own right. I'm going to see if I can get it to do... Yeah, is it done through their bodies? Is it done through their clothes? Or is it done through something else? So...
So, aerial moves, okay? The whole thing about like that. The smoldering passion, the having to surrender to this thing that's so powerful between the two of them. Um, it's all there. It's all there in 1921. And it sort of becomes the benchmark for um, tango performances. Notice that he is dressed as a, as a gaucho, as a, um, a man from the pampas, from the country. In the country, everything, I'm making the myth up, in the country, everything is pure and wonderful. And so he is the authentic spirit of Argentina. The truth of the matter is, historically, gauchos probably never danced tango at all. But it becomes such a cliche, the business of the spurs, the massive leather belt. He's got a whip, for goodness sake, and he's not afraid to use it, as you saw. So there's a bit of sort of borderline S&M going on there. Um, it's very powerful stuff. Very powerful stuff and eminently marketable. You can make money out of this. You can absolutely make money. So, dancing bodies, yep, gendered moves. Clothed bodies, definitely. Very different. And what else? Well, arguably, the playing out of some kind of gendered relationship between the two of them. So, scooting forwards. Buenos Aires, Tango, they do a lot of it, um, and then they don't do a lot of it. There's this um, uh, civil war in 1955 when Peron, Evita's already died in 1952. If you can imagine the RAF bombing London, you have some sense of what this civil war might have been like. And what happens is, sponsored by the CIA, um, a series of military governments take over, and in an effort, there's Henry Kissinger from the United States, greeting the president, and they push rock and roll. They want uh, a North American friendly country. And so the effect is to uh, try and steer culture towards that at the expense of tango. And during this period, tango does not thrive particularly. It doesn't go away completely, but it does not thrive. And increasingly, it's seen as old fashioned. And then, in 1983, because the economy is really going downhill, the generals decide, oh, let's invade the Malvinas. That'll make us popular again, and it'll distract people's attention from the fact that the economy is going downhill. So they do. And we have the Falklands War, and the generals fall. And then, in order to create some untainted Argentinian sense of identity and some money, because the economy is in such a bad state, tango is a gift. It is an absolute gift, particularly to young people. If they can learn it, they can teach it, they can make money, they can be in these tango shows, of which um, Tango Argentino would have been the first, these touring shows, which go round the world as a result of that chaos of the Falklands War. And so what it means is that we get something of a tango renaissance, and it means that most people, first off, when they think of tango, they think of show tango. They absolutely think of show tango. They do not think about the social dance, or at least not immediately. They are different elements. So, coming to performance, there we are. Contemporary performance. Here we have, let's see if we can get it to play. <laughs> Show the woman was almost a sort of you know, 
just sort of piece of meat being flown around, thrown around. Um, I have to say, I find it deeply unattractive, but there we go. So you put in the words queer tango, and different things come up. First of all, you can just tell just by looking at it, it's not so red and black. It absolutely is not so red and black. Incidentally, there are evolutionary reasons why red and black works. None of you, obviously, have been onto a sex website. But if you go onto a sex website, you'll find it's in red and black. And there are evolutionary reasons why red and black absolutely works like that. It just does. So, you get imagery like this, which is two people having a dance together. It's not the performance thing. It's very much a social thing. You get women leading men. You get men dancing together. This is all predominantly the social stuff. So queer tango essentially emerges around 2000, 2001 in Hamburg, and it happens amongst a group of lesbians and some gay men who decide that they want to dance tango, but they want to dance it on their own terms. They don't want to be forced, if a woman, to follow, if a man to lead. And also, they want the opportunity, if possible, for a woman to dance with a woman and a man to dance with a man. And it's in the social arena that this emerges. Inevitably, there is a performance dimension to it, and that's what we're going to have a look at now. I'm going to zip through this stuff. We don't need that. There's lots of it going on. I'm going there tonight. That's where I'm going. Um, and we dance everywhere, that's where I was last night. So, there's loads, but there's performance, okay? And we're going to look at some. Here's one.
extreme form of masculine man uh, masculinity, and it is being performed. This is absolutely performing it. Um, they're doing it almost as if it was a fight. And, of course, the beauty of that conceit is, if they're fighting, then they're real men, aren't they? And there's not any danger of any, you know, affection between them or anything that might indicate anything to the contrary. And notice again the lighting, red and black, red and black, it's all there. So this actually, in a curious way, is closer to that norm of what a performance might be. It's just there are no women as meat to be thrown around. They're just um, uh, dancing with one another. And they are wearing dark, serious, manly, dark clothing. Nothing frivolous, nothing, oh yes, nothing gay while we're at it. Um, although, who knows? I think um, gay has uh, embraced extreme masculinity to the point of campness for decades. Now, I'm just going to do three little clips of two dancers, Juan Pablo Ramirez and Daniel Miranda Arroyo. Um, and I'm doing it because they do something very odd. In fact, they do three things. <laughs> Thank you. 
fascinating. It's beautiful to look at. They're obviously consummate dancers. It's amazing. The context is interesting. If you think about it, performance, the meaning, part of it comes out of where the thing is happening. This is at a mainstream tango event. And you have there two dancers who are, I would argue, actually drawing on that bit of the tango tradition whereby the dancers are taking great care of one another. They are flashy, you know, they're doing the most amazing things. But all the time there is this sort of magnetism between them and they are being tender with one another. They are holding one another. It is not pretending to fight in order to assert masculinity. On the contrary, they sort of don't need to do that. And the interesting thing is that in 2016, that actually is a spectacle that a mainstream tango audience will pay to go and see, which in a way is a sign of how much things have changed over time with regard to the wider world and attitudes towards these things. It ain't perfect and there are bits of the world that are still dreadful, but it is an interesting phenomenon to see nonetheless. Conclusions, conclusions. <clears throat> we are asking, how is gender realized in life? How is gender realized in tango dance performance? How can the gender in life inform gender in performance? And we're also looking at queer tango. So, how is gender realized in life? Well, <clears throat> I've offered you the Judith Butler model. Just think about it. Have a think about it away from here. How do you think your gender is realized? How do you think other people's gender is realized, made manifest? It actually matters to you as performers to understand how it's done. It absolutely does. Um, how is it realized in, in dance language performance? Well, we had a look at all sorts of different types of performance and considered how different forms of versions of gender are realized, how they can be done through movement, how they can be done through clothing, <coughs> how they can be done through uh, any number of different versions of these things. And then finally, how can the one inform the other? Well, this isn't a very complicated model, but I just wanted to make it overt to think about what it is that we do quite conventionally. That's you, where it says stage. That's you. The performer practices, so in life, practices, does it, and observes performative gender realization in life, if we take that model. So you notice things, but you also do things. And what this means is that you have a body of evidence to refer to as a performer. You think about it, it informs what you do on stage, and then that is your performance, your performance rather than your performative version of gender. I said it matters where it's happening. So in the audience, the audience also <coughs> practices and observes performative gender in real life, and that affects how they think of these things, and that will affect how they're going to receive what it is that you might do in terms of the realizing of gender through performance. And <clears throat> if you altered the context, I said the context matters, this model works, but it might happen differently depending on who that audience member is, or come to that, who you are as a dancer realizing performance. And that is it. That's it. Thank you. We have a little time, and I left it deliberately in case anybody had any questions that they'd like to ask. Do be brave if you have any. The chances are somebody else was thinking the same thing. Is this the, no, we want to go now? <laughs> Maybe it is. In which case, um, do, by all means. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.